All right. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. Right now, Father, I thank you for those that aren't here. We have some out on assignment preaching and some other ministries. And so, Father God, today we pray blessing over them. We pray your spirit to fall over them and in those ministries and that your word fill their mouth. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray the spontaneous of God to open up and that your kingdom, your kingdom shift will come and shift people, Father God, into your glory. From the outer court into the inner court, into the holy place, and then at the end of that, to be one with you. We pray that prayer today. Thank you for your word. Bless us, Father, with your, with your just an openness that, to perceive what you want to say today. Help it retain so we may apply it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. So I want to talk about partakers. I want to talk about fellowship, partnering, companion. This all stems from one word. I want to open this up today. Let's go to Luke chapter 5. We're going to start there. And we'll just kind of see where we go by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 5. We'll start at verse 1. Depending on what version you have, it'll read a little bit different. So when I read, uh, either come from the New King James, or I'll let you know I'm coming from an amplified uh, version to give um, the context of the scripture. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. We want to make a note of that. He got into Simon's boat. All right? Got into Simon's boat. All right? And asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. All right. He basically interrupted the fisherman's schedule of what he was doing. Come on now. Got in the boat, started preaching. You ever feel like Jesus did that? He just kind of stepped into your day and disrupted what you were doing? <laughs> because the kingdom has an agenda. Come on now. Hallelujah. Right. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. All right. So we're going to talk about the progressive move of God. Hallelujah. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners. There's that word partners. We're going to talk about two elements in Luke 5 about partners, and then we'll go into a couple other scriptures. In the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. All right? Reaction, we'll get into that. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Here's the other word, partners with Simon. They were with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on you will be fishers of men or catch men according to one version. So when they had brought them, their boat brought in their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Okay. Really important. <clears throat> Let's go back. First thing we notice, says he got in the boat and he preached. And one of the things we need to realize, any place with people can become a pulpit. That's right. Any place with people can become a pulpit. It can become a platform, a place to speak from on behalf of the kingdom. The religious spirit confines and restricts the preaching of the gospel from behind the pulpit. But the kingdom, the kingdom is an advancing kingdom. All right, the church is to be an advancing church. The Bible says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. 
The church is to be an advancing body. It's to be mobilized and moving forward. And one of the problems that we have is the church today does not understand possession of the gates of the enemy. One of the promises that was given to Abraham was, you shall possess the gates of your enemies. You shall possess the gates of your enemies, okay? So with that understanding, there should be an, an arising of the Spirit of God and the people of God to say, we're going to begin to shut down the gates of hell. First place we have to shut down the gates of hell is in us. Our eye gates, ear gates, our mouth gate, nostrils touch, okay, all of those kind of elements. Those gates need to become shut so that the enemy cannot possess them because if he possesses our gates, he got us. Amen? Right. So we need to begin to learn how to shut down the gates to the temple because once we shut those down, then he can't get into your soul. Come on. All right? So a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand how to shut down parts of their, their eye gates and their senses to make sure when a spirit, a familiar spirit, a temptation or whatever it is, you know, begins to come, uh, the enemy can't have an inroad. When every man is, when he's tempted, he's, let, he's tempted by his own lust. Come on, his own lust. So we want to make sure that we're shutting down those things because the enemy will dangle a carrot in front of us and, and lure us. He wants to lure us. That's what he wants to do, okay? And, of course, what the Bible says, that once sin has conceived. I talk about this. People don't understand. I repented. Of course you repented. But what you didn't understand is you gave birth to a sin child. Restoration is a different process from forgiveness. All right? Mm -hmm. I repented. Okay? You sow in the flesh, you reap in the flesh. Some fleshly decisions you reap longer for. And what we have to ask God to do is you're forgiven, we're forgiven, but we have to ask God to help us with grace to overcome the challenge of what flesh produced. Mm -hmm. All right? Hallelujah? Hallelujah? All right. And so every place becomes a, a pulpit. So Jesus comes and gets into Simon's boat. He says, put out a little bit. All right? Then he says, after he preaches, go out into the deep. And this is what God is trying to do today. He got us offshore a little bit. Got us out of our comfort zone. He just disrupted Peter's, I'm sorry, Simon, Peter's, he's Simon at this point, he wasn't Peter yet. Disrupted his work schedule. They're coming in, they've been fishing all night. Tired. We said it. They would have been tired. And I'll go into the scripture. We know they were fishing all night night. And so we got to watch. We don't know when a move of God is going to happen and our flesh will kick in and be like, man, I just got to work. I'm going to sleep. And the Holy Spirit is, is saying, I need you to push out into the deep. I don't need you to go to sleep. I need you in the deep. Mm -hmm. All right? Because you don't understand your flesh is rising, but it's your flesh that's going to stop you from seeing the move of God. Mm -hmm. You're about to block your miracle every time you let your flesh rise up when the Spirit of God is beckoning you and Jesus is saying, I need you to push out more. I need you to push out. And it's like he got into his boat, disrupted his day. Okay, it's morning. He's probably thinking, man, I can't wait to go home and get sleep. Right? Jesus gets into his boat out of all people. But see, Jesus is methodical. He knew that this was going to become his chief apostle. Come on. Jesus moves in a methodical manner. Jesus never does one thing without understanding the ripple effects behind it. When the word of God goes forth, he speaks one word. He understands that there's going to be ripples behind his word. One word will do multiple things. That's the multiplicity of God. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. Let's go have fun back there. That sounds like they're having fun. Hallelujah. All right, so launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. All right, so what's he say? But Simon answered, but. There's those buts. How many of us got a but? Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. So there's a but. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled, let's just say, all night. All night. You're exhausted. You're really not ready to hear a command from Jesus say, let's do it again. All right? And then you're already, you're already like, I've already done this before. It didn't work. Okay? <laughs> I tried this before. That's true. But nevertheless, what does he say? At your word, I will let down on that. I want to say this. This is part of the, the elements between the difference of mechanics of ministry and dynamics of the kingdom. See, one of the things God will do is he will allow us to move in mechanics to get into a position to pre be prepared for the dynamics. This is what we miss. We become, God wants us, there are times where God will allow us to set a pattern. 
Hallelujah. Because he knows that a pattern, once we're ready, we can handle the overflow. Let me say that again. We can handle the overflow because we become diligent, even though we didn't catch anything. Come on. We already know how to go about it. And one of the things I, I was looking at is what if there would have been some new new people learning how to fish on a boat? And, uh, you know, so now they have to learn. They had to be next. They were like an apprenticeship type. And uh, maybe they wouldn't have been ready. You know, first first time Jesus shows up and does a miracle, and they're like, oh, my gosh, look at all these fish. You know, then the net, they wouldn't know how to work the net. So they learn, they learn how to work the net. They learn how to work as a team. This is important. There's a difference between if you look at someone that has a fishing reel and a rod, right? Mm -hmm. You can only catch one fish at a time on a, on a rod and reel. The kingdom is teamwork. The kingdom, when it comes to harvest, when it comes to, to being fishers of men, you, can, you, you know, there's individual, don't get me wrong, there's individual evangelism. You can do the works of an evangelist. You can go out, win souls one-on-one. -on -one. But there's an element to teamwork that we've been missing in the church. Because whatever reason, whether it's pride, ego, uh, don't want nobody else to have the, the look more spiritual or look more anointed, uh, this is all wrong kind of motives. Personally, a father should want to push sons up. Come on now. Fathers should want to push sons up. That's why one of the things, and anybody that knows my heart, one of the things is to come to a place, first off, where we know each other in spirit. Hallelujah. Then... With a kingdom release, it allows for individuals to get up, utilize their gifting, utilize their offices, and become mobile. And that's what a lot of people are missing. They're missing that. you got one preacher, one person in position. That's all you'll hear, and you'll never hear another voice throughout the whole year. I'm sorry, but the Holy Ghost filled a lot of people. And I think Jesus has the ability to speak out of whose mouth that he would, you know, if, come on. If the time is, is in... They, they, they're living holy, living consecrated. They put in their time. They're, they're, they're servants. They're humble. They have, a, they have a right. There's a right. There's an age that you come in maturity where you have a right to speak on, uh, on like, two, two levels. You have a right to speak on behalf of the king. Then you have a right to speak for the, for, for the king. You're, you're the voice of the Lord, okay? And then you can be the voice of the Lord. All right? That's that spontaneity of the prophetic. You, you become, right now, you become the voice of the Lord. You are God's voice in the earth. Voice for the Lord. You have Logos, Scripture. You preach. You teach. Okay? But it's not uh, a, a right now rainbow word. This is what God is trying to, to move the church because in order to move the church, we got to have right now word. we got to have, because the church doesn't know what direction to go. Church is stuck in, in mechanics of doing the same things that only lead to dead works. Mm -hmm. So without the wind of the Holy Spirit, we're going to keep doing the same thing and not getting any results. But the breath of God, in this moment, he speaks and he says, nevertheless, at your what? Word. Word. When I was getting ready to do what I did yes, uh, yesterday by the assignment of the Lord, I, I got rebuked by the Lord. And I said, Lord, we've done this before. Big mistake. He said, yes, you've done this before, but he said there's been new blood shed on the land, and therefore there needs to be a fresh repentance. See, 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 I've gotten frustrated. We get frustrated because we're going forward. We're not seeing large results. But what we're not seeing is the, the small results in the way. We're not seeing sometimes in calculating each soul, one soul at a time, but it's building us up and getting us ready for the, for the harvest. Come on. That's right. So what happens? Simon's Told them, okay, we've done this all night. They're tired. Nevertheless, that you worried. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were breaking. All right? Now, this is important because when you feel the weight of the assignment, the weight of ministry, a lot of people have, they feel a call. They feel anointed. They feel God has purposed them for something. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, is they try, too many are trying to run a solo flight, trying to do it by themselves. And they've not built relationship. They've not built covenant. And so when we look into the next passage of Scripture, when, when the Lord tells us to do something, 
Simon does it. They catch the fish. Now they need help. Come on now. And who's it say that he called on? Who did he call on? Simon called on somebody. And he realized, if I don't call on you, I'm, gonna, I'm about to lose this. We're about to lose this catch. And that's what a lot I've seen ministries, the wind of the Holy Spirit blows, and some of the ministries have been immature in their in nature. Or they've been weak in nature. Not saying they didn't have good hearts. But because they weren't yet at maybe a full stature or didn't have maybe enough people to help. What would happen? People start falling through the cracks in those ministries because they didn't have the, the support. They say one person should only be accountable for, for 10 to 20 people. One person. One person, 10 to 20 people. That's And after you get past that amount, you, you lose your effectiveness to be able to effectively, especially on a one-on-one level. You can put a whole bunch of people out in front of you, and you can preach one on, uh, unto a hundred, one unto a thousand. But that's preaching. Relationally, discipleship, you need more people. And so that's, that's, that's why God had to raise up disciples, because he knew the principle of multiplication. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so seed bears fruit after it's yeah. its all kind. So if the leadership doesn't understand kingdom multiplication and all they're duplicating is just preaching, come on now. And they don't have partners to pull on to help disciple or pull in the catch or pull the people in, what's going to happen? You're going to lose them. Something's going to break somewhere. That's true. Because you don't have help. That's true. And that's why one of, one of the things the Lord's putting in my spirit is that our house, we, we've got, you know, we want to develop, I've been talking about the Kingdom Reign family, a strong love so that no matter what happens, no matter what's going on, we can talk. See, a lot of churches, you can't talk to that pastor about anything they say or anything they do because intimidation is the dominating spirit a lot of times. I'm the apostle. I'm the prophet. Well, whoop de woo When you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're carrying it around in a wrong spirit, then at some point someone needs to speak. Now there are times, I understand protocols, that sometimes you need someone of a like anointing or caliber to speak. But sometimes God just uses some of the, some of the most simple people to, to, to say something if it's done right in the right spirit and in love. Amen? Amen. And so I believe you know, leadership should be able to say, listen, you know, I'm not going to allow you to dishonor me. But yet, at the same time, you have a right to hold me accountable. Every leadership okay. should be, be willing to do that. Because if you're saying you want to be more Christ-like, amen, amen, then you should be willing to be held accountable. If you hurt someone's feelings, you said something, you, get, you gave a mean face, you gave a mean spirit. You know, sometimes, when I was talking about this, <laughs> is sometimes the prophets get really agitated. <laughs> and and we, we, we're under warfare uh, right. sometimes, witchcraft, you can feel this, this stuff. And sometimes you just don't really feel it bubbly social. Right. Right. Uh, you know, you're in warfare. Right. You know, and, and, and you're not going to have that, that you know, jolly face on because you're in warfare. You're wrestling with principalities and powers because of the office that you carry. That's right. And the enemy knows if you get your breakthrough, you're going to bring others through. That's Hallelujah. Good. That's good. So, so he reaches out. And what did he do? So they signaled to who? Their partners. Partners. This is very important because... The word uh, partners here, you're going to like this, is the word metokas, all right? It means those who were in the undertaking or in the sharing of, the, of, the, of like a same endeavor, all right? They're partners. Now, we are partners in the kingdom. Another thing is, is the word metokas means those that work as a partner in a, in a work or in, as in an office or like a, uh, like a dignitary type. Uh, where individuals are of a life. So, for instance, you have police department, they are partners because they're all policemen. You have fire department, they're partners, they're all firemen, they have the same uh, understanding of the work, hallelujah, that they're doing. They're committed to the same kind of a work. So, when the net began to break, they had to call to those who were committed to the same work. You, come on now. I, I hope you all hear this in the spirit. And this is, the, this is one of the things that as we're getting ready, I believe we're getting ready and we're being positioned for revival for our region. Mm -hmm. I don't care what anybody else believes. 
I don't care if anybody doesn't believe in us or me or who we're connected with. If people don't believe revival's coming, I don't care. It doesn't matter. If people didn't believe Messiah came. Right. Hallelujah. They still, Israel's still waiting on John the Baptist, the forerunner. They put a nice placement when they have Passover meal, believing that and hoping that when they do Passover, John the Baptist, or well, the forerunner, Elijah, the forerunner, is going to come and sit at their table for Passover because they're still waiting for the Paschal Lamb. Come on, they're still waiting for the, the Pesach element of Messiah to come, and they don't even understand Messiah has already come. The forerunner already came. You don't have to put a plate out and hope he comes up to your house. You can now accept Yeshua. Right. And hallelujah. hallelujah. And so when God speaks, it doesn't matter what we have to hold on to what God has said, no matter what anybody else believes. And sometimes we have to go against the current of unbelief of a generation and even church leaders or religious leaders, Pharisee of Pharisees type spirit that will resist the move of God. Come on now. So they reach out to partners. And what we need to pray, we need to find out in the spirit, who are we partners with? Just because you have associates, you have people that you're associated with, doesn't mean they're your partners. It doesn't mean they're going to link up with you. That's true. That doesn't mean they're going to see your, you know, I mean, if they were in the boat and the, and the fish were, the fish are going under and the, the, the net's breaking. You know, who else is going to understand, oh my goodness, they, look what they got. They're about to lose it except people who do the same thing. Right. They're going to see the urgency. The boat is going under. If we don't get out there and help right now, we're going to, they're going to lose. Come on. And then on top of that, they're going to benefit from coming and helping. Come on. So Jesus was in the boat with Simon. Gets them out into the deep. And this is, and then it, when they got the catch, they pulled on the partners. And I believe this is where we're headed. We're going to go out. There's some things God's calling us into some deep places. Some people say, you're taking on a whole lot more than what I think you should. Come on now. How many, how many of you have ever been there before? But nevertheless, at his word. If I got a word, it doesn't matter what. One word trumps a thousand words. Come on. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you. So they went out and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Peter, okay, he's not even rejoicing over the catch now. He's not going, oh man, look at all what we're going to get out of this fish. Man, all he could do is bow down at Jesus' feet. And I believe that the humility God wants to, to put on some leadership, when we see this next harvest, I've seen some people have revival, and I'm sorry to say I don't see them at Jesus' feet. There needs to be, there needs to be such a humility when God begins to use us, right. and the supernatural and the miraculous of God begins to break out. There needs to be such a humility right. where you know, I don't, when the miracle happens, we go back to Jesus' feet. Come on. Hallelujah. Whatever, whatever he does, we go back to Jesus' feet. We're going to bow down back at Jesus' feet. Hallelujah. Oh, bless the Lamb of God. So he departed from me. I'm a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so were also, here comes the other, uh, other ones now, the other ones that are going to be uh, walking with Jesus. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, now, who were they? They were partners with Simon, right? Okay, that word partners is the word koinia. Koinia. Now, the beauty about the word koinia is it denotes an even uh, closer kindred relationship than mentokas. Okay? Because um, you can have people in the same field, and it doesn't mean they get along. So now we have koinia. Now we translate that in the kingdom of God. I just feel the Holy Spirit. In the kingdom of God, we translate it with an understanding it's the God kind of fellowship. Mm -hmm. It's a God kind of fellowship. And now it's not that we're, we're, we're just Christians and we sit beside each other. It's we're Christians and we're connected because we bear that same heart. We bear the same mandate. We, we, we love the same king. Come on now. We're, we're now kindred in spirit because... Because of who he is. See, one of the problems, what happens, our soul gets in the way of the spirit. And if we if we could just literally 
uh, if, let the Spirit of God refine our soul to where we're not opinionated about people and judgmental. The Spirit of God, we would find out, would begin to sovereignly connect us because we'd be connected with Jesus and each other by the Holy Spirit. Amen. But what happens is, is the soul rises in mind, will, and emotion, and we begin to pass predetermined or pass judgments, and then when the Spirit tries to do something, we let our soul or an opinion or a judgment rise up and where God could be saying, I really need you to connect or I really need you to do something. Be like, I'm sure all of us, but you don't know what they did. Wait a minute. The Lord knows all. You don't know who they are. We say things out of our mouths that's really ridiculous to the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's, it has no weight. It has no weight to him. Um, you know, so last week we talked about we need to make sure that we are free from our own predetermined judgment. Because we pass judgment on an individual, and then we won't connect. And one of the things, even when a person's, whatever state they're in, we have to be willing to love on them. Right. We have to love on them. And that's, you know, uh, I heard a story years ago about Billy Graham. And uh, Franklin Graham wasn't serving the Lord. And uh, for Billy Graham just kept loving on his son. Just kept loving on him. Didn't preach to him, just love on him. And uh, people say, well, why do you do that, Billy? Why do you do that? He said, because I don't want when he, my son comes back to the Lord that he has to reconcile with me as well. Think about that. That's such a powerful statement. That you don't have, they don't have to, you loved on them the whole time. And so when it's like, a, you know, a prodigal son coming back, that you just welcome them right back in because, because the, the level of grace and mercy that's on us is so strong because of who the Holy Spirit is and who Jesus is in our life that that judgment, that judgmental, critical thinking just goes right. out the window. You know, it says in the scriptures that don't judge anything before it's time. Right. All things will be made known and manifest, and, and every man will have his reward from the Lord. Come on. Right. All right? So, so we don't want to judge ahead of time. Bless God. So anyway, that word is the word koinia. And that is a high level of connection and, and fellowship. And there's a couple places that... It denotes in the scripture about that close fellowship, close uh, association. And it could be in a good way. You can have koinonia in a bad way, or you can have koinonia in a good way. And we want to have koinonia in the spirit in, a, in, a, in such a way, it's like the upper room, where they, they, they were so connected in the spirit that the, the mandate of, of God was on them so strong that they were able to link together, work together. Come on now. When it's the spirit of God, they got that, the Holy Spirit. My goodness, it fused them together. They, they just had an encounter, and they had a glory that nobody else ever had in their life. What kind of, what kind of connection would that cause them? Just like the apostles that walked with the Lamb. They, they experienced something when Jesus would do one-on-one -on -one teachings, and he, would take, and he would preach to the multitudes, but then he would unveil to the disciples what it was that he said, because the hearers, hear, their ears were clogged. They couldn't hear. Come on now. He would unveil. He said, unto you it's appointed. It's unto you it's appointed to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. And so what would that be like sitting with Jesus? And what's he doing? Jesus called a bunch of people that didn't know each other. He called them and said, come on, follow me. Right. Woo! That's my bottom. Even in the day, in a period of time, when there were false messiahs. And that's what a lot of people don't teach, that there were false messiahs popping up in the land. People say, I'm the Christ, I'm the, I'm the one, I'm the promised hero of Israel. You know, just like old day when prophets would prop up and they would put on sackcloth so that they knew what the prophets would wear. So that's what the prophet, prophet wore a camel. Okay, I'm going to put on the camel. It's like the fashion statement of the day. Whatever the, the big name preacher is, uh, if I put that on, I guess I can be accepted as a prophet. Or if I learn their terminology, I put on their terminology, that means it makes me a prophet, right? Come on. Hallelujah. So that, that the encounters, the encounters join people together. Whatever you do, it joins individuals together. Now, you can have partakers in worship with God, hallelujah, in close relationship with one another, or you can have partakers with demons. You got partakers with demons. And so you can be a partaker or have fellowship uh, or partner, or be a companion of either one. And it denotes that once you have koinonia, you be, when you're a partaker, you're also, you know, a recipient. Come on now. 
to partake, you become a recipient. So whatever you're partaking in, or whoever you're partaking with, denotes that you're also a recipient with, or whatever it is that you're partaking. And so we find different scriptures, like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, talks about this is in a bad way of partaking. We'll read that. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, verses um, 18 through 20. Observe Israel after the flesh are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. All right? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or the, what is offered to idol anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to fellowship with demons. The word fellowship is the word have coin and with. It means I don't want you to have anything that would open up the door. And Paul was talking about there's a couple of levels where uh, one was that, and you can read about this, uh, they would sacrifice at the top of the, the hill and they would bring the meat down and sell it in the, in the, in the valley. Paul addresses that, but then he also wants to, to let them know not to be a partaker though in what they're doing. Don't fellowship with what they're doing. Hallelujah. So don't have a koinonia. Don't get yourself so involved that you are relationally tied and then you become a recipient of what's been put on the altar. Come on now. They sacrifice, he says, it very plainly. And that's the, the tie-in when we get into uh, Deuteronomy 32 and 17 and Psalm 106. God very clearly says they sacrifice to demons. Israel at times didn't even know what they were doing. They were so they were making koinonia, they were making relationship, they were making fellowship. And the church today has to have a spirit of discernment because we, the church doesn't even understand that with some of the things, the tabernacle and the sanctuary is to be holy. Holy. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize. They're trying to get numbers into the church rather than getting people, come on, into the kingdom. Good. Into a building. And so... To do that, they're opening doors to other things that open doors to other things. Come on. They're, so that you put one thing in place, but without an understanding. Like, there's a lot of entertainment in the house of the Lord today. Entertainment spirit. You, you, you've got them captivated to look at something, but their spirit hasn't united with the Holy Spirit. Their spirit has not connected with the Holy One. Hmm. Come on. So, so it doesn't matter how, how captivated they are. The only way they stay captivated is if you keep entertaining. And so what we have to do, we have to get people to a place that they know what they're fellowshipping with. Come on. And that's the problem with a, house, a lot of places today. They do not know who they're fellowshipping. Who, what are you partaking of? When you come to whatever church you go to, what are you partaking with? Come on. Whatever is released from that pulpit, whatever, whatever is officiated at that altar... Whatever it is in that's in the spirit, you have you have actually become a partaker with it, and that's not taught in a lot of churches today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's why if, you, if the pastor's defiled, the house is defiled. Mm -hmm. It opens the door when the pastor's dirty and they're doing dirty things. It opens up a, a rift in the spirit realm, and people will wonder why they go into certain churches. And when they come, they come out and they feel like, man, I feel like like something got on me. It wasn't the you know, especially if you're spiritually discerned and you go into some place and come out and know that you've been slimed. Come on. It's mm -hmm. like watching Ghostbusters when Slimer would run went down, you know, I've been slimed, you know, kind of kind of thing. Come on now. And you don't even realize that, that whatever's in the spirit got on you. And so you gotta shake it off. You gotta get back off. And uh, all right. And that's why God is calling the, you know us back to that place of intercession. Joel two and seventeen says to the priest to it's just like the song said, weep between porch and altar. Make an intercession. Because they're in the outer court, they're in their flesh. we got to make an intercession because they were between porch and altar, the place of sacrifice that made atonement. But now you got to stretch. you got to stretch. got to stretch. I want to say it again. got to stretch for heaven and earth to merge. That's what Jesus did. He was the chief mediator. Come on now. So that heaven and, and those that were in the earth, they, they, they could become not just earthbound, but be heaven-bound. Come on. Mm -hmm. So, what are we partnering with? Who are we fellowshipping with? Plays a factor. 
Uh, and when we're getting ready to do the work of the Lord, we just can't call on anybody. <laughs> we cannot just call, I'm going to say that again, on anybody. I cannot call on a dirty gift. I'm sorry, I will not do it. I don't care how wonderful a gift you have. You give dirty, you dirty. I mean, you're dirty, your gift is dirty. All right? And so I don't, I don't know what you'll be confusing. We don't need no uh, Nabu, an Adab anointing. How many of you know who those are? Two boys offered up strange fire. Right. We don't need no strange fire. All right? I want holy fire. Holy fire, all right, when we release, release the holy fire of God, we want them to receive our sacrifice. Hallelujah. God wants us as a church to come to such a place that our the koinonia, the fellowship is so strong that we can begin to affirm each other. I want to give you a scripture. Look at Philippians 1 and 17. We can, we can actually begin, because I know you, I can begin to say, uh, I affirm them in the ministry. I affirm them, I affirm their character. I affirm who they are. Apostle Paul, oh, I'm sorry, did I say Philippians? Yes. I meant Philemon. How do you Philemon? It's a reggae. <laughs> Philemon, right after Titus. Philemon 1 and 17. Yeah. If then you count me as a partner, here's that word partner, receive him as you would me. Okay? But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. So he's Paul's affirming Philemon and saying, listen, just receive him. That's the, that's the relationship level. He's repentant. He's sorry. And so when we when we have that kind of relationship, when we built that with people, especially when people are just coming out of the world, they've done wrong, they've come, they've made a real genuine repentance, and, and maybe they, as a leadership, they've repented to you, but... We, they may not have repented to everybody else yet. People don't know that, you know, that they've really had a heart change. That's where relationship, this is where you can't just be a preacher. You can be a preacher, but you can't just preach and not know the state of people. That's right. Because you don't know who's had a heart change. And Paul goes to bat for Philemon to the point he says, listen, any debt, anything he's done wrong, I'll pay you back. So just so that he can be free. Because mm -hmm. he really repented. He was really sorry. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So that's one element of koinonia that allows for that kind of a relationship. Just like when the prodigal son came back to the father, what did he do? He put the robe on and the ring back uh, on him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do a teaching on that ring. That mean, means he has an authorized right to do the affairs of the family estate. And that's what we need to be able to do is help people come back in to a state or a place of uh, well-being so that they can start to move for their father. Come on now. Hallelujah. So we got to get people freed up. Um, last, last scripture, 2 Peter, uh, chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1 and 4. I'm going to start at verse 2. We'll read through that. We'll close out. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and, Jesus, and of Jesus Christ our Lord. And his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Alright, to life and godliness. Hallelujah. <laughs> Through the knowledge of him who called us by what? Glory and virtue. There's a lot right there. We could just park on that and we could tear that apart right there. To, to, to see in divine nature and how it corresponds to who has called us, and then what he's called us into. Amen? All right? Amen. By which have been given to us an exceedingly great and, pre and precious promises, that through these you may be what? Of what? The there it is. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In this element, hallelujah, in, the, in this aspect... 
we find that word partakers is once again the word koinonia. Koinonia. So it, it denotes that God kind of fellowship. It denotes that closeness. It denotes that fellowship. And what you're partaking with, you're a partaker now, you're receiving when you partner with God, divine nature. Amen? And so that's what we got to know. Who are we partnering with? And when we're meeting with people and understanding, you know, if people are partnering, you know, with us, are they also receiving from us as, as leaders part of the divine nature? Sometimes you're going to disciple someone that, you know, they're not on that level where you're at, but are they receiving? Like Philemon received from Paul to the point he was liberated. Hallelujah. Right. All right. But then you have an element of the koinonia of those that we actually connect with to do work. To do work. And we got to watch that. That's why the Bible says that Israel was not allowed to partner or make a covenant with ungodly alliances when it comes to business deals. Because they were not going to hold, the world's not going to hold to the same standard as kingdom people. That's true. Amen? Amen? So there was not to be a partnering or an agreement with somebody that wasn't in covenant. So everything that God does is birthed out of covenant, out of relationship. So it stems from our relationship with him, we covenant with him, become partakers of the divine nature, and then the body of Christ, he wants the body to have the koine, the God kind of fellowship, so that we can become, we fellowship and become partners and we partake together. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. I bless you. I honor you. I extol you, God. Amen. Father, I pray right now that your glory and your power just seal the word. And I just pray, Father God, that as uh, we get ready to go our way, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father Jesus. God, that you would just, you would just, oh, continue to mold and shape and change us, Father God, into the image. We want to be partakers of the divine nature, and we want to be partakers, Father